Hello, my name is Paul Chapler and I am one of the professors here at WVU in the Division of Exercise Physiology within the School of Medicine and my expertise are on the cardiovascular system, uh, specifically how um, aging and disease states impact the cardiovascular system and how it transitions from rest to exercise. So I'm going to give you about a 30 minute lecture on the how the cardiovascular system, that is the heart and the blood vessels, and how they are regulated to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the exercising tissues and organs, and how during exercise we increase that activity to provide that increased demand for oxygen. So initially we'll go over some of the structure and function of the heart from a very simplistic point of view, um, how oxygen is plumped, pumped through the heart and around the systemic circulation and how the cardiovascular system is regulated to meet the tissue demands. So what is the key thing about the cardiovascular system is simply to supply the body with oxygen and nutrients. We breathe in oxygen from the atmosphere that gets goes through into the lungs and through the alveoli where oxygen is then diffused into the bloodstream. Um, it's taken to the heart which is then pumped um, that oxygenated blood is then pumped out through many, many uh, vessels um, throughout the systemic circulation. And then um, the, that oxygen is diffused into the organs and tissues and carbon dioxide is picked up and waste products of uh, cellular metabolism. And then that excess CO2, carbon dioxide, is breathed out into the atmosphere. So what really is the key fact is that um, determine that oxygen delivery. We have the heart, which is um, essentially the cardiac output, that is the amount of blood that's pumped per beat per minute through the blood vessels. And that cardiac output here is influenced by what we call the volume of blood, that is stroke volume, and the frequency in which the heart is contracting and beating. In addition, the other aspect of this is that is the oxygen content how it's carried in the hemoglobin, that those red blood cells, how it's binded to the hemoglobin, and then how much of it is dissolved and diffused through, will be picked up on uh, by Dr. Mark Alford, uh, another professor here at Exercise Physiology. So my set of lectures, uh, slides, will focus really on this cardiac output and blood vessels. So what is the cardiovascular system? It encompasses both the heart and the blood vessels that allow the blood carrying oxygen nutrients to be transported around the body. It has five uh, main functions of the heart and blood vessels. That is one, to deliver oxygen to the active tissues, to return that deoxygenated blood that is predominantly now filled with carbon dioxide to the lungs, which is then breathed out. The transportation of heat and byproducts of cellular metabolism from the body's core to the skin so that, that is when we sweat, so it becomes an, we, an efficient way of removing these uh, excess byproducts and as such keep our core temperature within normal levels. The delivery of fuel such as glucose or fatty acids and the transportation of hormones and these hormones play an important role because they act as chemical messengers especially when we're stressed or when we need to exercise. We send hormones are released from the glands and then are transported around in the blood to the heart and other organs that either increase the force and frequency of contraction of the heart and I'll come on to that a little bit later. So there are five important functions of the cardiovascular system. What is the circulatory system? So you can see here at the center of the, is the heart and then we have a system that has and this is an oversimplified image but what you see here is a pulmonary system. This is where the oxygen or deoxygenated blood uh, from the, where the right side of the heart, which is this side, this deoxygenated blood, predominantly deoxygenated blood, is transported to the lungs where that carbon dioxide is breathed out and the oxygen uh, molecules are breathed in. And then you see this kind of uh, network of, of vessels. These are your capillaries. And this is where the oxygen transport uh, diffusion occurs. And then that rich oxygenated blood, highlighted in red, now travels back to the left side of the heart where it then is pumped around the systemic circulation 
The systemic circulation plays a key role in delivering the oxygenated blood to the key organs. That includes the brain, uh, the muscles, the liver, the kidney. And again, um, as uh, the oxygenated blood trans uh, is ported to those organs or those muscles, there's diffusion of oxygen out of the bloodstream into the tissues and a pickup of carbon dioxide, which is then transported back to the right side of the heart and then enter the pulmonary circulation again. But simplistically, the pulmonary circulation predominantly deals with what we call deoxygenated blood, that is predominantly carbon dioxide, whereas the systemic circulation predominantly um, transports oxygenated blood. So this is the heart, and what we see here, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes on, on describing what the heart looks like and, and its role. You see that we have four chambers, two on the left side, your left atria and your left ventricle, and then two on the right side, your right atria and your right ventricle. And then you have these vessels coming out, going to the heart that allow blood to be transported through. The heart's basic um, mechanism or basic need is to beat, to pump blood out of, um, out of the heart to the body, to the tissues, to the lungs, etc. So it must contract. It has a very thick muscular wall. You can see this kind of pink wall here. Well, this is the muscle, you know, what we call myocytes, that contract and help squeeze blood in and out of the heart. The left side of the heart is typically thicker than the right side of the heart because the blood from the left side of the heart goes out through this large artery known as the aorta. And that has to go all the way down to your toes and then back up to the left side of to the right side of the heart and as such it needs a great deal of force to drive that blood all the way down to your toes and back to the heart again so typically the muscle in the wall of the left ventricle here is very thick thicker than what we see on the right side other key aspects of this is that we must ensure blood flow in a unidirectional manner that means blood which enters through what we call the pulmonary veins which are coming from the lungs and now are rich in oxygen enter the left atrium and then pass into the left ventricle and then out from the left ventricle to the aorta. We don't want blood going from the left ventricle back into the left atrium or even going from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. Often as a child we have a hole in this thick muscular section here known as the septum that allows mixing of the blood because at that point where the, the fetus is provided um, oxygen from the mother's um, system. But uh, um, upon birth this uh, hole in the heart is closed typically and that closing of the hole and, sh and ensuring a thick uh, muscular wall here and a barrier between the left side and the right side ensures the blood moving in a unidirectional manner, that is from the left atrium to the left ventricle and out. Other aspects that ensure unidirectional blood flow are the valves that separate the chambers. For example, the left atrium and the left ventricle are separated by this mitral valve that closes when the ventricles contract, forcing blood out through the aorta. That stops the blood going back into the left atrium. Furthermore, when the blood fills the left ventricle and the mitral valve is open, so blood's leaving the left atrium, flowing through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, these, these aortic valve here is closed. And again, that allows blood to fill up sufficiently in the ventricle, generate sufficient pressure to then contract and force blood out. So the same thing on the right side. You have these large veins known as vena cava, which are the largest veins in the body and blood that returns back to the right side of the heart from above the head enters via the superior vena cava and blood from the lower part of the body enters the, by the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. And then the blood, uh, once enough pressure is generated in the atrium, will then move into the right ventricle through this tricuspid valve and then out through the pulmonary artery and then this blood through the pulmonary artery is off to the lungs to become rich in oxygen again. And again, you see we have valves 
both the tricuspid valve and this pulmonary valve that ensures the blood goes in the correct direction. Now here's a, an example of what I was saying about the left side versus the right side. You can see that the wall on the left side here is very much thicker than the wall on the right side. And that's purely to generate enough force to move the oxygenated blood uh, around the body. Whereas the right side predominantly deals with that, the oxygenated blood going back to the lungs, it's a shorter distance to travel. Now this is a, a cross-sectional um, uh, anatomy image, anatomical image I should say, of a heart, of a dissected heart. This is the left side, I'm sorry, this is the right side, and you can see that the wall on the right side here is very much thinner than the wall on the left side here, this is the left ventricular wall. This is one of the papillary muscles that uh, have this um, kind of thread-like um, cord that connects to the mitral valve so that it ensures that the valve actually closes properly. And then here you have the septum. You can see how thick the septum is and how thick the, the left ventricle wall is. Now this is um, actually somewhat of a diseased heart because the thickness of the wall is actually a bit too big. And then this yellow stuff that surrounds the outside is pericardial fat. So fat through, uh, as we get older, we tend to build up fat uh, surrounding the heart. Now I'm going to show you a B-mold ultrasound image of that. This is actually my heart from many years ago. And it shows you the contraction of the wall of the left ventricle here. This is the left ventricle here and this is the left ventricle wall. This is the left atrium, this is the mitral valve, this is the aortic valve and the aorta would be here, and this would be the septum, and therefore this will be the right ventricle, which you can't really see too clearly with b mold ultrasound. But what, what I want you to see here is how the muscle in the wall here, in the vent left, left side, and the septum get thicker as the heart contracts and squeezes blood out. And as the heart squeezes, the left ventricle squeezes, you'll notice that the mitral valve will be closed and this aortic valve opens. That will allow blood to move out past the aorta. Conversely, when we want to fill the ventricle, this aortic valve will be closed, the mitral valve will be open, and you'll see a contraction of the left atrial wall forcing blood into the ventricle. Then the image will switch to what we call a short axis view, just to show you a, a different image and then we'll go to, to some colour flow patterns after that. So you can see how thick it gets when it contracts. So it's contraction, relaxing, contraction, relaxing. And this is just some uh, the movement of the blood flow. And then this is the, this is the uh, short axis view with the papillary muscles. It's the left ventricle. Now we change it to a four chamber view. This is the left ventricle, left atria, right atria, right ventricle. And again, you can see the squeezing in, of the wall to ensure that the blood is being contracted out. And this is just the two chamber view. So, how do we actually get the heart to contract? What you initially have here is a conducting system that has what we call a pacemaker of the heart, which is known as your sinoatrial node. And that's located in the left atria, right up here. And you can see that this green dense network of nerves are throughout the atria, spread out through the atria. Because what happens is this electrical signal that's generated from the sinoatrial node that then travels through these fibers, these nerves, throughout the atria and as they travel through those nerves and come in contact with those heart muscles, the cardiomyocytes in that region causes those cardiomyocytes to contract and that would mean a squeezing of, of the muscle, squeezing that blood down into the right ventricle here or into the left ventricle right here. So we have this conducting system in which we have an action potential, this electrical impulse that is generated and actually the heart generates its own electrical activity. That's why you can take the heart out of the chest and you can still see it beating for a short period of time. Known as automaticity. It has its own inherent cardiac beat. 
Now we can act on that inherited, inherent cardiac beat by manipulating the signal to it through changes in catecholamines and chemical messengers that either act to speed up heart contraction and, and heart frequency or slow it down. So in order for the heart to contract, this uh, action potential electrical impulse is generated, the SA node that travels through the atria, causing contraction. That action potential then arrives at another um, node, then I see it, AV node, atrioventricular node, and that focuses the action potential, the electrical impulse, so that it generates or moves down what we call this AV bundle here, separating out to the left and the right bundle branches. And as the, again, this uh, action potential moves through the bundle branches, it causes or comes into contact with those cardiomyocytes in that region, causing that muscle to contract. It then that uh, action potential eventually ends up at these Purkinje fibers and which are spread throughout the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And again, as that action potential propagates through those nerves, it causes myocytes to contract, heart muscle to contract. And like you see the image down here, it causes a squeezing of the heart muscle. Now, the timing of all of this is critical. We must have atrial contraction first before we have the ventricle contraction. Imagine trying to contract both the atria and the ventricles at the same time. We're essentially pushing blood against each other, opposing forces. So essentially what you want to see is the atrial from the SA node to contract and then you see this, what you see throughout here is these time points or the delay in, in the action potential of this electrical impulse. So essentially there's a 0.1 second delay between the firing of the SA node and the firing of the AV node. Meaning there's a 0.1 second delay is sufficient for the atria, both the left atria and the right atria to contract and squeeze blood into the ventricle. Then that 0.1 second delay causes the action potential to propagate through the bundles into the left and right bundle and you can see by the time it gets down here, there's a delay of 0.18 seconds. So 0.18 seconds later from when the SA node contracted, this region of the heart will then contract, forcing more blood out to the pulmonary artery or out on the left side to the aorta. So this timing is critical. And we actually change the timings depending upon the health of the health, how healthy you are, if you're an endurance trained athlete, this 0.1 seconds will actually be prolonged, it'll be maybe about 0 0.12, 0 0.13, because we have other mechanisms and adaptations to healthy exercise training. When we, when we actually go from rest to exercise, and we do like a run, we actually shorten the duration of this 0.1, because we want to increase the heart frequency. So as I said before, the heart has its own rhythm, its own inherent heart rates. So if we were to take the heart out of our chest and we had no chemical messengers, no stimulus on it, our heart rate at that point, our extrinsic heart rate would be about 100 beats per minute. However, we have these extrinsic factors, these chemicals, these neurohormone factors that regulate our heart rate. And it regulates the heart rate anywhere from about 40 beats per minute, which you will typically see in a highly trained endurance athlete, or up to about 200 beats per minute at peak exercise. And that's through these chemical messengers. Those chemical messengers, they come from the, the um, cardiovascular control center, which is located in the medulla, in the brainstem, right here. And this acts to increase speed up the heart rate. For example, when we're, we're about to run a race and we're in the blocks, we have these hormones, these catecholamines, spilling around that stimulate the medulla to increase the firing of the electric action potentials at the SA node. So we have this anticipation of us about to run a race and our heart rate has already started to accelerate in both its contraction, its force of contraction, and also the frequency by which it is beating. Conversely, we can slow the heart rate down again by reducing the, uh, act, the um, signals from the medulla to the heart and slow that heart rate down. 
And like I said, it's all about how um, we have the nerves um, and the location by which those nerves are in the heart. For example, remember this is the SA node. And we have these parasympathetic nerves that act on, typically on the SA node. You see that this purple line does not propagate into the ventricles region. So the parasympathetic system acts a slow heart rate down. And that's what we typically see at rest. When we're sitting here in a chair, our system is more of a parasympathetic system. It acts a slow heart rate down. We don't need a lot of fast heart rate at rest because we don't need a lot of oxygen and nutrients to our muscles. However, we suddenly exercise or we suddenly take an exam, we get nervous. What we have is the sympathetic system becomes activated. And that those nerves are located both in the atria and also the ventricles. Because activation of the sympathetic system through catecholamines increases the firing of the electrical impulse at the SA node. It also increases the firing or the movement of the action potential electrical impulse through the left and right bundles. It also increases the forcefulness of the contraction of the heart itself. So those, um, by either releasing acetylcholine to slow heart rate down, or by releasing catecholamines from the glands, adrenal glands, we can either speed up or, or slow down our heart rate. And that means we either speed up by which the blood and oxygen and nutrients are then delivered to the excising tissues or organs and vice and the removal of carbon dioxide. But how do we get blood there? Well, we have this pump, we have these vein uh, vessels like pipes, like plumber's pipes, in which can remove our water or our waste from our own home. So we have a large artery known as the aorta, which um, leaves the heart, that then moves into a larger artery, into a smaller artery, and into an arterial, and then into a smaller capillary that allows for the exchange of nutrients and gases. Then the waste products are also picked up at the capillaries and moved into the venules, back into the vein, and then back uh, to the right side of the heart via the vena cava. These pipes act to deliver the oxygen. We also have other uh, roles, but for, for today we're, we're going to call them pipes. So there are different pipes though. The arteries are very much different from veins. So I'm going to explain that a little bit now. Arteries are thick walled. If you saw it before, the aorta is right at the level of the heart. The heart generates a great deal of force. And if you were to put a vein at the level of the aorta, it would rip. So the artery of the aorta has to be thick walled to accommodate the high pressures that is exerted on it. It has a lot of smooth muscle, that is the mu muscle itself in the wall. And then as you move into the arterioles, they get different composition of the wall. They're smaller, they are branched. There's less, um, um, there's a thinner wall, but they do have a lot more smooth muscle because these arterioles play a role in redirecting blood flow. At rest, we don't need a lot of blood flow going to all of our body. So a lot of the time, a lot of our vessels are constricted. That means that the lumen diameter, this hole in the middle of the vessel is smaller. But when we exercise and we have exercising muscles, we want to open up that, that lumen diameter, that hole size, so that we can get more blood to it. So these resistance vessels can open. As you can see here, that the lumen size is increased quite, quite drastically. And that is to increase blood flow to that region. And here's a, a diagram of... Um, an artery, very thick walled. You see that here. It has a lot of nerves and blood vessels in itself as well. Now, when we get to the capillary, it's very thin, it's one cell thick, and it's, that's key because that's, this is where oxygen diffusion occurs. So the oxygen in the blood trans is transported or diffused out, and carbon dioxide is diffused in through a one cell thick vessel. And at rest, most of these uh, capillaries are actually dormant, actually closed, so blood flow goes around them. But when we exercise, we open up those extra capillaries to allow more blood flow and more surface area to be exposed to the oxygenated blood. So you can see at rest here, 
These are all capillaries, but they're dormant. They are closed by these pre-capillary sphincters. Now, when we exercise, we open up these pre-capillary sphincters, allowing blood to move in throughout the entire capillary network, allow more of the diffusion of oxygen and nutrients into that exercising muscle or organ. Now, veins, on the other hand, are small, thinner. They predominantly deal with deoxygenated blood because they have very low pressures at this point in time. They require valves. Now, valves in veins play an important role because blood at this point is going against gravity. These veins capture the blood and help propel it back to the heart. And I have a diagram in a minute to show you that. Also, at rest, a lot of the blood, which we don't necessarily need to use, 64% of the blood is stored in the veins. And we can use that blood when we begin to exercise to increase oxygen and nutrient delivery. So the veins are thin-walled, um, less muscular-walled compared to arteries. And this is just the comparison. Of the two. You can see a vein up here, very thin-walled media layer, which is your tunica intima. Still has an endothelium, but has a valve. There's no valves in arteries. Very thick-walled, very thick muscular wall with a lot of connective tissue. And here's a cross-sectional image on the immunohistochemistry slide of, again, of an artery thick walled. This is a vein. Now, here's the valves. You can see here a valve in the vein. And as I said, blood goes against gravity on the way back to the heart. So if, as, we, as it's propelled up and then the, the vessel relaxes, blood would not automatically go back down with gravity. However, the valve closes traps that blood and then helps to propel it forward. And the way we propel it forward is via muscle contraction and squeezing, um, like contracting the muscles like the bicep muscle here, we're squeezing against the vein. And because we have a valve, it ensures that blood goes in the right direction, back to the heart. That's why having an active recovery is important after exercise because we redistributed all that blood to the exercising tissues. And then if we were suddenly stood still, a lot of that blood will, will go all the way to our lower limbs. And because we're not contracting our muscles, we're not getting the blood back to our heart and then brain. And if that doesn't happen, then we actually can faint because there's less blood going to the brain. Now, blood pressure also plays an important role in all of this. The highest blood pressure that you see, and blood pressure is defined as the force exerted by the blood on the walls of the vessel. The highest pressure you'll see is at the level of the aorta. And as pressure, as the blood moves away from the aorta down into the large arteries to small arteries to arterioles, you can see that the pressure decreases quite drastically. Then when it gets into the veins, it's very low pressure. This is why we need valves, because they have very low pressures at this point. So how do you regulate cardiac output? Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle per unit of time. And at rest in, the, in adults, it's about five liters per minute. And cardiac output is defined as both the amount of stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart, and also by the frequency of heart rate. And at rest, like I say, it's about five liters per minute. So five liters of each jars per minute. Now we increase this quite drastically when we're exercising. Now let me explain what stroke volume is. So again, the cardiac output is defined as your heart rate multiplied by your stroke volume. And heart rate we manipulate it by either increasing catecholamines to induce sympathetic activation and increasing the firing of the SA node and the AV node. And also we can increase our cardiac output by increasing the stroke volume. So at rest, blood enters the chamber, the left ventricle. And the blood, and then at the end of relaxation of the heart, when the blood is filled, left ventricle, is known as your end diastolic volume. Then the heart will contract. The ventricle will contract, forcing blood out through the aorta. And the amount of blood that remains in the heart at the end of contraction is known as your end systolic volume. And that this value is never zero. We always have a little bit of blood that remains in the ventricle at the end of contraction. So when you subtract your end systolic volume from your end diastolic volume, 
you get what you call known as choke volume. That is the amount of blood that's left behind. Um, now this will change with exercise. For example, now let's start, let's say we started to run a race and very high intensity exercise. We still have our end diastolic volume here, but now we've increased heart contraction. So more blood is for, is left is leaving the heart. So the amount of blood that remains at the heart in the heart at the end of contraction, that is your end systolic volume, is less. So now your stroke volume is a lot more because you have less blood remaining in the ventricle. So that's another way of increasing our cardiac output by increasing our stroke volume, but also by increasing our heart rate. And we need to do this because at rest, our five liters of, or five thousand milliliters of blood is distributed quite evenly through these all these organs. But when we exercise, about eighty-four percent of the blood now goes to the muscle. Before it's twenty percent, and this is a gradual thing. So as you increase your exercise intensity here, the amount of cardiac output going to your muscle, which is to this lower gray bar, increases drastically. So we need to increase heart rate and our stroke volume to, to accommodate this redistribution of blood flow. So let's look at this in terms of numbers. And I wanted to compare somebody who's untrained to somebody who's highly endurance trained. And what you see at rest here is that we have both the untrained and trained individual has about five liters per minute of cardiac output. And the way that's calculated is that each one has about 70, well, the untrained individual has a heart rate about 70 uh, beats per minute and a stroke volume of 71 milliliters. That gets us to our five liters per minute. However, our trained individual has the same cardiac output, but the way that individual achieves that five is very much different. They have a slower heart rate and a higher stroke volume. And the reason for that is the heart adapts to the exercise training, gets larger and bigger, so it's able to accommodate more stroke vo or more blood volume in the heart. Now we're exercising. This is an um, example of what happens during an exercise stress test. So let's say you're on a treadmill and every minute that speed is getting harder and harder until exhaustion. What you see is your amount of oxygen that you're utilizing increases quite drastically in a linear manner as you increase the intensity of that exercise. And so this is the key thing. We need to get oxygen into our system. So how do we do that? Through our cardiac output, partly. What we have here is that with increasing exercise intensity again on this x-axis, our cardiac output increases linearly to match the increase in aerobic capacity, increase in our, in, the increase in our oxygen demand. However, the components of cardiac output differ. You see heart rate increases linearly as well. But stroke volume increases to a certain point around about 50% of our maximal capacity and then kind of just levels off. And the reason for this is part of the restraints of the heart is a sac that surrounds the heart that limits the stretch on it. But in addition, by this point, the heart's beating so fast, it limits the relaxation of the heart. And if you're limiting the relaxation time, you're actually limiting the amount of time the blood gets to enter the ventricle before it contracts. So, in order to get oxygen into our system, we need to increase cardiac output quite drastically. And we do that through increasing our heart rate, mostly, and also through increasing our stroke volume up to about 50% of our maximum capability. So now when we compare maximal exercise in untrained versus trained individuals, we see a difference in the maximum cardiac output we can achieve. We see that each untrained individual has a cardiac output of 22, so they've gone from 5 to 22 at maximal exercise. And the trained individual has gone from 5 to 35. They both achieve the same maximal heart rate. For the endurance trained athlete, the heart is adapted, it's got larger, it's more efficient, it's got a stronger ability to pump and contract, and therefore it's able to achieve a greater stroke volume, which drives that higher cardiac output I want to ensure that this individual gets to the finish line faster or run for longer than somebody who is untrained. You can see there's an increase in four to five fold at rest, whereas an endurance trained athlete has increased seven to eight fold compared to the resting values. Now, exercise training is obviously very good for you and for many different reasons. 
and I wanted to show to you how quickly exercise training or detraining can reverse a lot of this. The next diagram here shows you the amount of time it takes to reduce our maximum aerobic capacity. These, these data came from a study in which highly trained athletes decided to were, were asked to lay in bed for 40 days and they measured their aerobic capacity. You can see how quite drastically after 10 days you're losing about 10% of your aerobic capacity, 20 days about 15%, 30 days of bed rest, and the only way able to get up to go to the bathroom. By 30 days they lost about 25% of their aerobic capacity. This individual lost 35%. So detraining or stopping training quickly starts to reverse. Indeed, when we look at this diagram here, again, this is a very similar study. Duration of detraining, 12 days, 21 days, 56, etc. Our maximal heart rate goes up a little bit, but not substantially. But what you see is this massive reduction, around about 8% of our cardiac output at, at, um, at 12 days. And by 84 days, they lost 10%. And most of the reason for this loss in cardiac output is due to the reduction in maximal stroke volume. 10% after 12 days, 21%, um, about 14%, 12% around 21 days, almost down to 15% at 56 days. So key thing is to maintain an active lifestyle to improve your, your ability, one, to remain healthy, to keep your heart healthy, to keep your blood vessels healthy. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I hope you found that interesting and informative. Um, I am I will provide you with my contact information and if you have any questions or if you're interested in joining the exercise physiology program, uh, please feel free to get a hold of me or my colleagues. Thank you.